Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today to learn more about micrometeorites. For those of you who tried to join us this morning, thanks for your patience on our technical issues. Uh, I'm Amber, the Public Science Events Manager at the Bell Museum, and today I'm joined by Scott Peterson. Scott is a community scientist and an engineering student with a passion for searching out micrometeorites and photographing them in great detail. In fact, if you visited the Bell Museum last summer, you may already be familiar with Scott's work. It was featured in the City Stardust exhibit, and we've brought back a part of that exhibit in a virtual way. I'll actually be posting a link in the comments for you to check out and explore more. As we learn more today, if you do have any questions for us, please enter them into the comment box. I'll be watching it closely and we will get to as many questions as we can. So thank you once again for joining us. For now, I'm gonna turn things over to Scott. Perfect, thank you so much. And thank you for anybody who is watching currently or who is watching it later. Um, so I'm just basically going to um, show you some things real quick about micrometeorites and then I have a little slide presentation uh, that we'll go through and I'll try and share as much information as I've learned throughout the couple of years that I've been doing this and uh, like Amber said if you have any questions um, feel free to ask them if we don't get to them now I will try and go back and answer some of them if there is any so um, first of all, I just, so I'm show as much about micrometeorites as I can. Um, but I want to show you basically how they look. I don't know if you can see, hopefully you can. In each circle, I have 20 of them. So there's 80 in each little, and I have about 20 or 30 of these all lined up. That's where I store them at. And I know where each one is and where it came from and, the roof that it was and how old it was. Um, and then usually I, I can show you a little, another little thing. There's more on there. I kind of start with that and then I, I put them in their forever home. But So let me show you um, my little presentation. We'll go here. All right, so this is basically my little uh, mascot guy. His name is Mike. I didn't give him that name, but Mike the micrometeorite. Um, and so if, if there's any other information that you don't get from this, um, you can feel free to go to my website. I try to put as much information as I can on there as well. So hopefully that'll help. Um, I'm going to basically kind of um, go over the history of micrometeorites and um, a little bit of the process that I do to find them. Um, I will uh, kind of show you some images of them. That's the best part. My favorite part is looking at how they actually look with detail. Um, and then we'll ask some questions at the end. So let's go through it. So what exactly are micrometeorites? Uh, the boring answer is it's a micrometeoroid that has survived entry through the Earth's atmosphere. Um, it's the boring answer because that's just what it is, but we'll get more and more into it as we go along. Um, the terminology for it is when the little piece of uh, particle is in outer space, it's a meteoroid, um, micrometeoroid for, for the small ones. But as it comes in through the atmosphere and you see that shooting star, that's a meteor, and then it's only a meteorite once it hits uh, the ground. And if you see that little... Um, GIF plane, um, there's little um, kind of particles that fly off of it. Even though they, they come from a meteor, that's not actually micrometeorites. There's little um, iron spheres, but those are um, just ablations from meteorites. True micrometeorites are small in space and uh, they're small once they, once they land on Earth. Um, so where do they come from? Um, it's funny, since I started learning about micrometeorites, a lot has even changed from, from what I know about this. Um, I first thought that that was just mostly comets, but I'll get into show you some of the other places that they come. Um, but here's a comet of uh, 67P. I have a little written on there, but you can see that uh, as they're coming in through the solar system, uh, they leave little particles, and that might be um, some of the places that produce micrometeorites. This is actually a, just a, an amazing image um, of a close-up on, on the comet itself. You can see the stars moving in the background and all the dust and everything kicked up and even the cosmic rays hitting the, the screen. 
this kind of just shows where uh, the stuff, the dust is at. It's mostly in between Mars and Jupiter. Um, that's also where the, uh, um, the comets mostly hang out and the asteroids. So uh, that is also what uh, might produce micrometeorites. This is kind of what most of the people think. It's kind of flip flat flip flapped back and, back and forth for me. Um, but now it's kind of it's probably both is where they, where is where they come from. Um, and as they're coming in and they, they heat up really quick once they hit our atmosphere, but they come in at seven miles per second. So just, look, I mean, it's fast. It's hard to comprehend, but it's just a little, it's basically like coming from Los Angeles to New York in six minutes and a, six and a half minutes. So seven miles per second is, is pretty quick. This is kind of what can happen. It's uh, something that going that fast hits. Uh, a, this is a piece of aluminum, and it was tested like this. But um, if you look at this image, you're like, holy cow. And then you might think of satellites and the International Space Station. Um, and this is the... Cupola, I think is how you say it. I could be saying it wrong, but you've probably seen images of this. This is the place where all the astronauts go uh, when they first get to the, the International Space Station. And I heard it's just, it's amazing views from there, obviously, but when they're there too, they can hear little dings. It's the micrometeoroids hitting the glass. Um, and it says right there, it's an amazing view that needs to be protected. And that's actually uh, speaking literally. So this is the outside of it, and they have to protect it, both from cosmic rays, but also from little meteorites that hit it so that uh, it doesn't damage the glass. And even more amazing, um, just how crazy this contraption is, uh, there's a mechanical uh, adjustment on the inside, and it holds the vacuum. There's no leaks or anything, and then it is able to, to move the things on the outside. It's pretty, pretty fascinating, but that's the to help reduce the damage from the micrometeorites. So uh, different shapes and sizes. Um, I'll get into the, the, the sizes of them mostly, but um, as fast as they're coming in, they heat up really quick and then they melt. So depending on that temperature that they reach while they're coming into the atmosphere, uh, they can either be unmelted or all the way up to glass. So you can see on the far left image here, hopefully it's on the far left for you too. And then on the far right, that's kind of the comparison. If it is coming in and it doesn't heat up too much, you can have it all the way be um, basically unmelted and just how it was in space. And then there's uh, barred olivine is a very common type and cryptocrystalline and then all the way up to just completely melted. Here's just another diagram and it shows the temperatures. Um, so unmelted is anything below uh, 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. And then glass can be all the way up to about 36. So that's, when they reach that temperature, that's kind of what happens to the material as it comes through. So where have they been found? Previously, um, there's lots of different ways to find them. We'll get into a couple here, but one of the first ways was kind of on accident in the Challenger expedition and they, uh, they were doing a bunch of different science, but they picked up material from the bottom of the ocean and the sediment down there, and they found little spheres. They didn't know what it was at the time, but later on we figured out that it was actually uh, micrometeorites. Another great location, um, somewhat ingenious way to find them is in the South Pole. Um, again, there's a lot of science that happens down there and all the scientists kind of need water to drink as we do and they have a water well that is there and they melt the water and it just kind of goes down and down and down each time more and more um, is melted. And throughout that, throughout time, micrometeorites have gone, uh, have landed on the ice or the snow and they get piled up over time. And so they all end up at the bottom. And um, some researchers in uh, the South Pole, they created a little vacuum that can go in the bottom and they sucked up a bunch of micrometeorites and that was one of the best ways that I've seen to, uh, to find micrometeorites. Another great way is to uh, 
just go along a mountain ridge in the, in the Arctic. Um, as the wind blows and the ice moves, it kind of collects right along that uh, the mountain ridge. So um, there's been scientists that have found thousands of them in just one area, like using this type of method. It's pretty amazing. Uh, there's also a couple of friends of mine that research through uh, sandstone. So they'll find fossilized ones that are really, really, really old and have deteriorated over time. And it's even, it's hard to, to tell that they're actually micrometeorites, but there's a lot of great science that can be done that way as well. But uh, what was once thought impossible, now we can find them in the cities. And that's kind of what I do. So I go on to rooftops and find them. Um, and if you look at the, the other ways that they've been found, um, they could be millions of years old. Um, but the oldest my micrometeorites are as, is as old as the building. So they're very, very young and very pristine compared to most of the uh, micrometeorites that people find. So you can tell there's a lot of great science just visually and chemically that you can get from the micrometeorites that are found in cities. So my process for finding the micrometeorites, um, it's pretty easy. Basically, I just, not easy, but basically I start on just looking on Google Maps and I will find a, a flat, old uh, vinyl roof like this one that's in the image. Um, this is a college that I went on. Um, but if I can find a, a see, they're usually either black or white um, vinyl roofs and they kind of are, they stand out pretty well when you're looking at Google Maps. But I will find that and then I'll find who owns it or if it's a school, I'll find who I should talk to and I just send them an email. Most of the time, probably 99% of the time, people are like, no, uh, no thank you. But you only need one or two to allow you to go up on there. Um, so I use a powerful magnet. And then uh, if I have enough time up on there, I spend as much time as I can, just so I can cover everywhere. I'll go to um, around the drains, like in this image, or in the corners of the buildings, or kind of like when it rains, all the material kind of settles in certain areas. You want to go to those certain areas and use that magnet. So my process, basically, I... I start with that strong magnet and I'll go around to all the, the spots and then I'll try and collect as much material as I can and put it in a Ziploc bag. Um, and then once I'm done, I'll bring everything home. That, that's not a picture of my home, but I thought I'd share that image anyway. You caught me. Uh, once I'm home with the um, bag of dirt, basically, I'll clean it really well. So you want to get all the organic material off and um, any of the really, really small particles. So I'll just wash it and wash it and wash it until the water becomes clear. And then I either let my material dry out in the sun if it's like a nice sunny day, or even actually right underneath me, I have a little science oven that I can put all of my sieves in and uh, dry everything really quick that way. So once things are dry, um, I put them in sieves and I can actually show you. So they're in the image too, but I just have these little sieves with different size holes in them. And um, I'll get to the next point. We know the size of the micrometeorites that are most common. So uh, the sieves kind of break up them in different sizes. That makes it easier to look underneath the microscope too so that the field of view is, um, everything's all equal. And then I'll just start looking underneath the microscope. Um, it takes a long time, especially when I first started like I spent a lot of time looking. It's a little bit easier now. I'll, sometimes I'll just throw in headphones and listen to music and kind of look under there and see what I can. I'll pick up the things that I think are micrometeorites. Some are just obvious right away. Some you can't tell necessarily, but I'll just pick up everything and then I'll go look at that separately. This is kind of a view of, uh, I mean it is, but this is kind of what it looks like as I'm looking under the microscope. Now you can see there's actually a micrometeorite in that picture. I'm not sure if you can tell, but it's, um, it's a little bit right of center. It's the, I wish I could point to it for you right now, but it's, there's a micrometeorite there. Hopefully you can kind of spot it out. It looks more circular than the other objects. Um, and there, there's a lot of little dust that can stick on the micrometeorites, even though they're very small. 
So um, I use an ultrasonic cleaner for jewelry to, uh, to take all the little stuff off. I'll just put them in a little um, objective uh, case and I'll put that into the, uh, the cleaner and then they come out perfectly nice and clean for ready for imaging. Um, sometimes you don't necessarily know that they're micrometeorite just by seeing them visually. Uh, most of the time you can, but to be absolutely sure, I bring them into the University of Minnesota. And then this wonderful woman, Annette, helps me out with the scanning electron microscope. So we can do chemical analysis, um, do amazing imagery. Um, and I'll try and get into some of that. The old image was uh, the old um, microscope. This is a picture of the new microscope that we use. And it is just, it's amazing. The images that we are able to get now I'll show you a lot of them. Um, they're just, they're fantastic. So I'm very, very fortunate to be able to use this machine. When we're looking at the micrometeorites, um, the chemical makeup is going to be almost universal for all of them. Uh, there's gonna be high amounts of oxygen, magnesium, silicon, um, iron, nickel, calcium, aluminum, and that is going to be for all of them. So if the um, analysis chemical makeup doesn't look like this, then I can know if it, if it was a questionable particle, then I know that it's, it's not a micrometeorite. You can see what it is. It's kind of the um, echo of the solar system. If you could push it into one ball and make a uh, chemical analysis of that, that's what it would look like. So we'll get into some images and see what they actually look like even close up. Um, as I showed you with that little slide, they're, they're tiny, right? So this is kind of a close-up of this. Um, very, very, very tiny, right? 0.2 to 0.4 millimeters is the average size. And this is what it looks like on a finger. They're tiny. But being able to, I don't know if you can kind of see, I got my little microscope right here and a camera attached to that, <clears throat> we're able to get some decent detail. So these are the different types. This one is a, a barred olivine. This is the most common type. This is what you're probably going to find if you start looking for them. So it's going to be this type of makeup. It's going to look um, like a barred olivine. This one too, you can kind of see the where it gets the name barred olivine. It has the little lines throughout it. Uh, this one has a metal bead in it. Uh, a lot of them will, um, but not all of them. But the metal bead is pretty amazing too because as they melt completely and the heavier elements um, liquefy in the center of the micrometeorite, or micrometeorite at that time, um, they, as it slows down, as it's coming in through the atmosphere, the heavier um, elements will kind of want to keep going through inertia. And sometimes they'll either completely come out or they'll leave little beads like this. So this is a good um, tell if you're looking for micrometeorites. You see this another one that has a, a large metal bead and even some of that metal kind of dripped along the outside of it as it was still heated up. This is the same one, just a, a scanning electron image of it. This is actually the first micrometeorite that I found um, on the, my college at the time. And I don't know, I, it's, Pretty, it's awesome. It's just so long ago, but it's a, it's a great little example of what a, a bar olivine would look like. This one I actually found in the bottom of uh, Lake Michigan. It's altered in ways that um, the fresh ones on the roof aren't. So you can see it's kind of got like a lighter color and all of the rust. It was probably a, a nice, beautiful bead on top, but eventually just from being in the water, it uh, accumulated all that. I didn't want to Put that in my ultrasonic cleaner because I, I like the way that it kind of looks right there. And here's a cryptocrystalline. These are heated up a little bit more than the barred olivines. Um, this kind is called a turtle back because you can see it kind of has like the little peaks on it. They're a lot smoother, um, different structure because of the heat. This is that same one. You can see there's a missing bead, so that there was a bead on top and then that fell out. 
This is uh, actually the second micrometeorite that I ever found in cryptocrystalline with that metal bead. Uh, the image is kind of, doesn't give it its true beauty. Um, underneath the microscope, it's extremely shiny. But to get decent images, you have to use a uh, diffuser to so say it's not reflecting the light um, too much. So uh, but this, this underneath uh, the microscope just looks amazing. It's really, really, really dark black and it's super, super shiny. Um, there's also glass micrometeorites, like we showed before, and um, some of them can be really, really smooth. Some of them have a little bit of features like this one. Um, here's a pretty one with metal beads on both sides that came from spin, as it was spinning into the uh, Earth's atmosphere. This is actually a friend of mine's micrometeorite from Norway, but you can see it's, a, it's got amazing color. It looks like a, like a jewel. This is a porphyritic. This is probably my favorite micrometer that I found. It's just got a lot of really beautiful details. And um, I don't think I brought it in for scanning electron microscope yet, but once I do, you'll be able to see there's a lot of perfect squares that are in there with the crystal formation. Here's another porphyritic type. And there's even transitional. So um, this one is barred olivine and glass. So Part of it, as it was coming in, was heated up more than the other side, and part of it completely melted, and the other part of it didn't. And here's kind of what the unmelted ones look like. So this is kind of what would represent as it was in uh, outer space, what it would look like. And this one too. This one is sliced in half. These are some of the scanning electron uh, images. You can see you can get a lot more detail even though they're black and white, they still turn out pretty amazing. Here's kind of a comparison between uh, the two. It's the same micrometeorite. One is the color photograph that I took, and then uh, um, the one using the scanning electron. Pretty interesting. And this one too. So um, you don't have to, because they're not conductive, but most of the micrometers before I bring them and put them into the scanning electron microscope, you want to cover them with some type of conductive material. So I think this one is gold over the top of it. Um, so you just basically, or maybe it was carbon, I think it was carbon. You just basically put like a thin little coat over it so that it doesn't charge as you're uh, trying to get the images of it. But this is the same micrometer and you got to see it's super shiny because it's got that coating on it. There's, this is a, a porphyritic close up. Um, it's, I could look at them all day. The crystal formation on them is just so interesting. It's fun because all of the micrometers they have, I think there's 1,700 that I found now, and they're all different. Even though there's the, the types, they all are just interesting. Once you see them at first, it's, it's pretty amazing to see. And this is that same green uh, glass one that we saw from a friend in Norway. You can see um, how smooth and how perfect it is in most spots, and then around uh, the metal bead, iron nickel bead, there's a little bit of crystal formation. It's kind of like a, uh, how a snowflake forms. A lot going on here. This is another porphyritic, uh, kind of, you know, and it's shiny in some spots and a little bit dirty too. Um, so this might just look like some fancy art, but it's actually, it kind of is, but it's, um, a micrometer, as small as they are, as small as I've shown you, we can cut them in half. And this is um, what it would look like, what it does look like on the inside of one as we've uh, polished it in half. Um, and then the different colors are actually the elemental makeup. So the brighter the color and like the top one is, it's all oxygen. So where it's really, really um, intense is where it's all oxygen and then there's calcium and, and iron. Um, the brighter it is, it shows you more that that element is in that location. But they're so interesting. Again, I can look at these all day. Same thing, but these are just from the, um, the scanning electron. But these ones are cut in half. That's that same one that was in color. You see little holes in it, little spots, little crystals that have formed you throughout the whole thing. Here's a barred olivine one with the crystal formation. 
and here's just a little perspective. So as small as they are, we can kind of dive in and get deeper and deeper and deeper into them. Um, it's pretty amazing. So when you see how small they are and how much detail we can get at the uh, microscope, and we can just go in, there's crystals like all the way down. It's, it's, it's amazing to see. And here's some of the magnetite crystals, or Christmas trees as we call them, because they kind of represent a Christmas tree. Same, same type of thing. They come in different uh, shapes and sizes, obviously, but there's different types of crystals. And as you can see, the, the brighter they are, the, the heavier the element. Um, and these ones are kind of um, suspended in a matrix of, of glass. And another pretty makeup. And here's a really close up image of one of the metal beads. I love this image, it's really interesting. So I had a video on here that I wanted to um, kind of go over how I image these. You might just think looking at them that you're able to just take one single image, but um, to get these because you know they're spherical, under the microscope, you can only see parts of them at a time because of the uh, field of view. So an image like this, um, to, for each one of them, usually like four or 500 different images. And then you can put them into computer software and then it'll take all of the area that is um, defined and, and, and clear and it'll stack them all together until you get a whole image. So I do that with every image that I have. Uh, some of the possible scientific contributions there's so much to be learned still from micrometeorites. And uh, I just, I try to work with whoever I can with uh, for anything that I can, but uh, micrometeorites contain water and they contain uh, amino acids. So um, in the early formation of the earth, it could be possible that earth got water from meteorites and um, life itself could have started from the source of micrometeorites or meteorites. Um, this is kind of, so as big as meteorites are, right? Um, there's about 50 tons that come in every year. And as small as the micrometeorites are, they usually uh, come, I'll tell you on the next slide, I think it's one uh, micrometeorite per square meter per year. So they're all over, they're everywhere you, you just walk outside and they're there. They're just hard to find. Um, but there's about 3,000 tons per year that come in and eventually land. But there's what is it, 30 tons that uh, try to get in. And I've heard estimates of up to 200,000 uh, tons. So um, it'd be nice to kind of dial this in and, and find the, the actual number. And, and the same thing with this, just kind of like dialing in. And one micrometeorite per square meter per year is a, is a good estimate for right now, but it'd be nice to be able to kind of dial that in a little bit more. Um, so I th there's different types, as I was mentioning before, there's uh, like barred olivine, there's cryptocrystalline, there's glass, there's porphyritics, um, but there's also different types within those types. And we can kind of um, dive in even further and you know find the transitional types or even, um, there's been some new types that I found that don't kind of fit into the, the categories that we already have. So it'd be interesting if we can find even more different types of names that we can call each one that with their uh, physical features that they look like. Uh, one, one of the biggest things that I have to do all the time and I enjoy kind of doing is uh, describing the idea that micrometeorites are just round spheres. Um, when I first started looking for micrometeorites, I went on my roof and I found a little metallic object and I was like, ooh, I found a thing from space. Uh, later on, I found out that they had to be spherical. So then I went back up on the roof and I went in the road and went everywhere and I found little spheres. I was like, oh, this is great. I brought them in to a, a different scanning electron and I took images of them and I was like, oh, I got micrometeorites. And then I finally learned um, that they have, they have certain features and they have certain characteristics. Um, but I get emails all the time and I get um, people thinking that they have found micrometeorites when they're just sadly man-made objects so, or human-made objects like these right here. Um, these are everywhere. I went up on um, 
MIA, the Art Institute's roof, and that roof is hundreds of years old, 100 year old. Um, I should have found more micrometers than I've ever found before, but most of what I found was objects like these. So um, more of stuff like this from um, man -made tools, even from cars going down the road and go, putting on their brakes, you get little spheres like this from lighters, from anything. Um, fireworks even produce little spheres. Uh, this is one of the first ones that I thought was a micrometeorite and it ended up just being probably something from a grinding wheel. Uh, even the stuff that makes the paint on the road reflective is just little tiny spheres that people sometimes confuse with micrometeorites. Uh, and these, I got this one and there's another one. This one is actually one that I found on the Bell's rooftop. So uh, this is an actually pretty interesting one. And uh, I, I like this one a lot and they're really large. I didn't find any, I found two on uh, the Bell rooftop when they allowed me up there. And um, I, so this micrometeorite is, I forgot what the age of the roof was at the time, but two years. So this has only been on earth for less than three years. It's pretty amazing. And here's another image of the other one that I found. So um, again, if you want to go to my website, there's a lot more information I try to dive in. I know I probably missed a lot here. Um, and there's really great articles written too about micrometeorites in my cell. Um, it's on my website or you can just kind of Google around and find them. And I think now, if we have any questions, we will get into that. Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. Um, we did actually have some questions that came in. Uh, the first one actually came in from Kathy, and she was wondering if residential gutters and downspouts might actually point to caches of micrometeorites. Like, would you be able to find them in the mud where the rainwater collects? Yes, absolutely, possibly. So, um, as I was saying before, the rate of fall is, is about one per square meter per year. So that's why I look on really, really large roofs that are old because it's just better numbers, right? The more is falling on it. On your house, it, it rains all the time. You're not really looking. You clean out the gutters. It, it, a lot of uh, kind of pushing them around. So it's a great place to, to look. And I found them on my house. But... Um, it's hard, especially when, when you're trying to get into it um, to find a micrometeorite on your roof. It's and you don't exactly know what to look for. It, it's it's difficult, but they're there, so it's worth trying. Excellent. Um, Tina um, actually had kind of an interesting question. She was wondering if you had the opportunity to actually study micrometeorites from space, or I think she meant in space, actually. Yes. How do you think your methods and your study would change if you were in that, through that different lens? Well, so there's people that have actually kind of done that. So NASA has this uh, stuff, I actually have some of it, but it's this, it's aerogel and they've caught them in aerogel and they can look at them that way. But if I could actually like just, you know, go to them when I was in space, if that was the question, I think that would be pretty amazing. I don't know what I would do, but being able to see how, either how loosely they are, you know, like, they might just crumble if you could actually touch them out there um, and until they finally melt and land in here. But I don't know. That's an interesting one. If we can make that happen, then we'll see what we can do about that. Excellent. I think, I think that would be a, a great thing to make happen, right? Yeah, get me up there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Glenn actually had a question. Um, he just wanted a little bit more explanation about how you um, actually separate the potential micrometeorites from the ambient material. Um, a little bit more about what that process looks like. Sure. So as I am looking through them, I'll, I'll sieve everything out in those sieves. And then I know kind of where the micrometeorites will be within the, the right size. So I just take another um, little magnet and then I'll put them on a piece of tape and I'll put that tape onto a glass slide and then I'll put that glass slide under my microscope. So now, um, especially after I've seen so many micrometeorites, it's kind of like engulfed in my brain and it's, it's they just pop out. But um, if you can imagine, there's kind of that one image that I shared where was, there's all these different objects and they are um, kind of rigid and um, they're just earth-like. 
the micrometeorites, there's no other way to make something look like a micrometeorite that you can do on Earth because they've, they've gone through this process that only micrometeorites have gone through. So they will look aerodynamic, you know, they will be spherical of, of sorts. They'll have something that looks kind of like a football sometimes or something that looks like a teardrop. Um, and then each type, like a, the barred olive bean, has those lines. So you can look for those bars. If you see those right away, it's kind of a good contender to, to pull aside and look further in. Um, but the more and more you look at them, the more and more you'll see that they kind of all share these type of features. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like Nicole, and, and I'm hoping that this is a word that's not familiar to me, um, but I'm hoping you know what it is. Nicole is wondering if you can see Widman Stanton patterns in them. So, uh, kind of, yeah, that is, um, I don't know if I can show you, unless this is an actual meteorite, she's talking about that, so that pattern is actually called, I can't even say it either, but, um, <laughs> it's, so that, those are formed just through age-long, years and years and years and years and years of cooling and really slow process. Um, the micrometers are, are so small, you basically only see, um, the, the, the crystal formation. So you're kind of getting even beyond that. If you looked really closely at a piece of iron like that, that has the, uh, the, the acid formation that kind of stuck out, um, you, if you look really, really close, then you, you're kind of getting beyond where you can see that. So you don't, you don't get to see them in, in micrometeorites, sadly. Thank you. Thanks for the explanation. Yeah, that was a good question. Uh, is, is wondering something that I'm actually wondering as well in, in terms of how did you actually become interested in micrometeorite hunting? Um, and, and also I'll add to that just, you know, do you have any suggestions for people who are interested in citizen science, regardless of what topic they might be interested in? Yeah, absolutely. So I became interested, just I've I loved science for as long as I can remember. And I've always been kind of a, a skeptic. So what really, really got me into it was just one day, you know, I, I, I learned about them and I read this article that you can go on your roof and find them. So I did that, you know, and I got excited, but not too excited. I was like, oh, I got this, but it seemed really easy. So no big deal. Um, and then once I found out that what I just found was not a micrometeorite, then it kind of, it kind of angered me a little bit. And I'm like, okay, now I have to find a micrometeorite. So that's when I learned that they were spherical and, um, anything that was spherical and on your roof was from space. Um, so then I did that, I found them, and then I learned that those weren't micrometeorites. So now that just escalated it even more, and then I, then I became my mission to find micrometeorites. Um, and then once I finally did, um, then it just kind of became an addiction. And luckily I had uh, John Larson helping me out. He is uh, my, basically my mentor who helped me along the way kind of learn what I needed to do and how to find them and everything. He has a great uh, Facebook page too, if anybody wants to look for that and a few books that are just beautiful. So um, yeah, I just, I, I had to keep going until I actually found one. And then there w there's not too many people in the world that actually have. So once I became one of them, it's just, it, there was no looking around or turning back. Um, I recommend anybody do it. You can, again, it's hard, but you can find them in your, in the street. So they are everywhere. You just kind of have to go to where they would um, kind of pile up. So again, looking in your roof uh, gutters, looking at any gutters, if you can get access to a roof, call me, I'll go with you. Um, that's probably the best place to look, but just look anywhere you can. That sounds, that sounds like a, a great prospect. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more question. And one actually just came in from Kenzie. Um, she's wondering if um, they can be found all over the world or if there are some hotspots. So, you know, I don't, they, they are, they can be found all over the world. And again, the, the average rate is one every square meter per year. So they are literally everywhere. I don't necessarily know if there is hotspots. I mean, I'd have to, dig more into that just because maybe if they skim off of the poles, maybe they might go um, back into outer space. If they're coming in head on, maybe they're more likely. So maybe around the equator, there's more than at the poles, but I think there's so many of them, it would be actually hard to tell um, where there'd be more likely to, to fall, but it's a good question. 
but you can find them absolutely everywhere. Okay, that's great. Uh, one of one of our audience members has suggested that you maybe actually put together some kind of citizens project uh, or citizen science project in Zooniverse, um, absolutely. Yeah. Start collecting their information. Yeah. Um, and I, and I know what I said when we were on our last question, but I have one more that came in that I... Keep them coming. Let's go. Like, <laughs> where people are asking, um, this actually came from Judy, and she's wondering as a beginner, um, what kind of equipment they would need to get started. So I use kind of the best things that I can use just because I do it so often and I kind of make everything easier for me. But really all you need is a magnet. And if you want like a sieve from... Uh, from the kitchen that you use for flour. Um, really all you need is a, a magnet and you can, you don't have to have a, you kind of see my microscope, but you don't have to have an amazing microscope. Even, um, I use the, the smallest objective that I can when I originally kind of try and search them out. So like, a, a, a decent microscope will help. Uh, maybe fine glass probably won't work, but really all you need is a, a microscope and, and dirt and a magnet. Excellent. So, well, it, uh, we are, it does look like we're actually out of time today, Scott. Um, I do want to thank you so much for sharing your science with us today, um, and especially your, your passion as you got interested in this and, and just how far, um, how far you've come in, in being yeah. able to learn more about it. Yeah. Um, I do also want to thank our audience for today, um, especially for jumping in with all of your questions. Um, events like this are made possible because of generous donors um, like our like our members and, and our audience. Um, and any kind of gift of any size has a huge impact. So if you're interested in supporting Bell Museum programming like this, um, I'm actually going to be posting some details in the comments. Uh, we will also try and follow up on any questions that we didn't have a chance to answer today. Um, and I wanted to let you know that our next live program is actually going to be on Wednesday, June 17th at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And at that time, you're going to have a chance to hear a little bit more about what's going on inside the Touch and See Lab. Uh, even though we're closed right now, there's still lots going on inside that space. Um, so we hope you'll join us then. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thanks again, Scott. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you, everybody.